Okay, thank you all for coming out <clears throat> this evening for a talk on um, historic South James Street in Goldsboro. Uh, the Wayne County Public Library received an American Rescue Plan grant uh, from the Humanities Funding. Uh, the grant was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, so that's how we're able to fund this research. Uh, so remembering South James Street, an area of downtown Goldsboro that was once thriving, once a thriving place to live, work, and play, South James Street had these businesses depicted in the icons on the screen, all within two blocks. A theater, restaurants, groceries, pharmacies, funeral homes, pool halls, insurance companies, lawyers, doctors, barbers, and more. This evening, I'll be presenting research conducting on South James Street in Goldsboro, roughly from the 300 block. I know this map is confusing, but from the 300 block here at West Bruce Street down two blocks to West Elm Street. So it's the 300 and 400 blocks through time of about 1920, 1940, and 1960. Just a couple of more maps to get you oriented. So this is James Street. It runs parallel to Center Street and George. We're looking at from Spruce again to Elm Street. We recognize that South James Street in Goldsboro is just one area where African-American businesses thrived in Wayne County and that many more areas need to be studied and documented. These are some of the other neighborhoods in and around Goldsboro. Greenleaf, Goldsboro Heights, Gully Homes, Hell's Bottom, James City, Little Washington, and Webtown, just to name a few. The sources used to conduct this research has begun to track the built environment of this one bustling stretch of one of Goldsboro's extensive African American districts. This presentation is not a history of James Street or South James Street. It is simply presenting factual public information combined with some private memories of native people of Goldsboro and the mixed use atmosphere that South James Street provided early in its long history serving the black community. Uh, South James Street, from Spruce to Elm Street, since at least 1930 has been zoned. This, another confusing map, is a zoning map from 1930 of James Street and the era, area that we're talking about to, uh, this evening. This tight, tighter woven hatch mark area is zoned business in 1930. This top part with the diagonal lines is, is uh, zoned residential and neighborhood business. And it pretty much is zoned the same today. Um, so that's the stretch here at Spruce. It's a little bit of mixed um, neighborhood business and residential, and then fully business, the south end. In a bit, I'll mention advocacy efforts in other cities and towns in North Carolina and across the country that have been successful in recognizing and praising the historically black business districts and their respective municipalities. Um, research and public awareness of South James Street and other neighborhoods is needed to preserve the history of the African American community in Goldsboro and around Wayne County. After the presentation, we will provide information on how community members can document and share memories of historic businesses, places, and individuals in our community-based digital exhibit, Wayne County Memory. We start in Florence, South Carolina, to the south, just over the border. Um, historically, since the late 19th century, Black Main Streets successfully catered to the daily business, cultural, financial, lodging, religious, service, and shopping needs of African Americans who were otherwise being excluded from using white-owned businesses and organizations in the community. 
In 2018, the city of Florence, South Carolina, installed this state historic marker. Pictured here is Victoria Jones Grant, whose father owned Casey's Pool Room on Dargan Street years ago. Ms. Grant said in a, in a newspaper article, to recognize him now fills my heart with joy, and it's about time. This marker reads, it's very similar to businesses in, um, in, on James Street. The 200 and 300 blocks of North Dargan Street were once the center of a thriving African-American business district in Florence. A number of black-owned businesses operated here, including restaurants, barbershops, funeral parlors, and pharmacies. These businesses provided services to African-American customers who were often denied access to white-owned businesses. By the first decades of the 20th century, North Florence had become the principal African-American residential district as patterns of racial segregation became more fixed. The shops located on, on North Dargan Street, just north of the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, which is the same railroad that runs through Goldsboro, served the predominantly African-American residents who lived and worked there. Discriminatory Jim Crow era segregation laws that were often cruelly enforced throughout the Southern United States and the prejudiced use, use of similar contentious tactics elsewhere in the United States led to the creation and development of African American business districts and corridors in many cities. The Negro Motorist Green Book published between 1936 and 1966 was both a travel guide and a tool of resistance designed to confront the realities of racial discrimination in the United States and beyond. Jackson's Drug Store, which was located at 400 South James Street, was in the 1954 and 55 Green Book. The ad there at the top is a uh, newspaper article. Uh, Scott's Cafe over on Gully Alley was also advertised. Others were in Wayne County, were the Anchor Inn in Mount Olive, the Black Beauty Tea Room in Mount Olive, Garris Dry Cleaners and Hatters. Uh, that used to be where the City Hall Annex is today, the uh, Garris Dry Cleaner and Hatters. Rainer's Beauty Parlor on Devereux Street, Scott's Cafe on Gully, James City area off of Slocum and Pine, that, that area is where Scott's was, um, and Thornton's Teenage Casino, <laughs> a shaving parlor and barber shop in Webtown. South Carolina's African American Heritage Commission has a website and mobile app where you can discover over 400 African American cultural sites and browse by location or category. North Carolina's African American Heritage <coughs> excuse me, Commission has a similar website called the Green Book Project, where you can browse over 300 businesses listed in the Green Book. The size of historic black main streets varied from town to town. Some were only a block or two, while others were multiple blocks. Two of the most successful examples were in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the other in Durham, North Carolina, both being referred to as Black Wall Street. Today, many historic African-American business corridors have largely disappeared or have faded from memory due to urban renewal, interstate or highway development, and the gentr gentrification of neighborhoods. And our neighboring Kinston, North Carolina, between 1901 and the Depression era, 1929-1930, the 200 block of Queen Street was filled with a variety of black businesses. At the 200 block were two hotels, a bank, this, this one in the picture, the Dime Bank, which still stands today, and several grocery stores. Heading south down Queen Street at the 300 block, 
There's a bakery, more grocery stores, two cleaners, three barber shops, a druggist, and several eating houses. Farther down at the 400 block was another hotel, shoemaker, and a black-owned theater, the Palace Theater. This, this area was simply known as South Queen Street. In an article written in February of last year uh, in a news outlet in New Bern, a man by the name of Clarence Monroe was quoted as saying, we had, we had businesses to aid the community. We had food, clothing, legal services. Everything was right here in Five Points. We had our home. This area was referred to as Five Points and often South Broad Street. In 2010, Mr. Monroe's brother, Corey, started the Black Broad Street Business Association to try to rebuild the area. That's a picture of Five Points today. Over in Burlington, in the Burlington uh, Times News, a man by the name of Dean Paul Stevens wrote last February in his article, How City Planning Broke Up a Black Business District. He wrote, in neighborhoods throughout the country, black-owned economic districts operated and thrived out of necessity thanks to Jim Crow and the entrenched racism that it en enabled it. At its, height, uh, at its height, Black Bottom, which is what the district was referred to in Burlington, around Burlington's Worth Street was a staple for black life. References to the Black Bottom district as, I'm sorry, as a district date to the 1920s in Burlington. Stevens goes on to write, revitalization was the tool for Burlington to break up the business districts. And listed here are, I think about 15 cities in North Carolina which have either historic markers or have recognized their black business districts and either what they are referred to as or simply the street name. This was compiled by a news source. It's over 200 cities and towns across the United States with recognized black business districts. It just keeps going. <laughs> Black-owned businesses in Goldsboro were not just located on James Street. A series of maps I've plotted on Google Maps shows the pockets or neighborhoods of black businesses within Goldsboro according to city directories from 1920, 1940, and 1960. This particular one that I've put up is from 1920. So we have these books called city directories. They were it's kind of like a phone book from as early as 19, I think the furthest back we go is 1914 that we have in-house here. And it lists, classifies um, businesses in the back of it and it has an asterisk beside black owned businesses. So I plotted them and this is just 1920. I'd plotted all three years, but it's a lot of, a lot of, um, maps. <laughs> but all of these are black owned businesses that were in the um, city directories and South James Street is right here. You've got Little Washington, you got right downtown Center Street, kind of Webtown area and James City. Um, and in the north is Greenleaf um, up off of like North William Street. So it appears smaller businesses like barbershops and groceries 
are in each of the neighborhood pockets around Goldsboro, such as James City, uh, Webtown, Little Washington, and Greenleaf. South James Street was a nucleus. One local patron of the library suggested to me that it was the pride of the city for blacks. South James Street <clears throat> was the hub of merchant and economic vitality for the black community for decades. So after the presentation, I'd like for you all to look at what I have set up over here on these tables, uh, some of the resources that I used to uh, conduct this research. This is the Sanborn Fire, uh, Sanborn Insurance Map Company. Uh, we have several of the maps. They were used for fire insurance purposes before we had GIS, digital uh, computers. Um, they mapped every city um, pretty much in the nation and uh, did not leave out Goldsboro. Um, we have the earliest that we have in-house is 1913, 1918, 1924, two 1924s, and 1957. Um, the sources used in the research like Sanborn maps and the city directories including Census records are not the be-all, end-all of what and who was physically in the built environment of this part of the city. But they are reliable resources to start with, and some businesses elected not to put themselves in the city directories or the green book and operated outside of the published advertisements and conducted business simply by word of mouth and reputation. This is just a, another example. You're welcome to flip through the city yearbooks, I mean city directories, um, at the end of the program. So I'm going to start focusing on James Street itself, actually, and some of the businesses that used to be on, on James Street. Um, we'll start in the 1920s, then go to the 40s, and then wrap up in the 60s, and then we can have some conversation. In the, going back to 1914-15, in the city directory, Dr. Frederick, Robert James Frederick is, list, is listed as working at Wayne Drug Company, which was then located at 114 Chestnut Street, which is, if you all remember where the D.S. Simmons building was on Chestnut, that's 114. That's not the building, but that's 114 West Chestnut Street. And he lived around the corner at 110 and a half Spruce Street. Uh, it was a two-story dwelling, but it's no longer standing. It's a vacant lot today. Um, in the 1920 federal census, he is listed as a 34-year-old black man, born in 1886 in Duplin County, living in the third ward of Goldsboro at 217 West Elm Street. So this is five years later, 1920. Uh, he's head of house. He's married to a woman named Annie. She is 26. His occupation is listed as a druggist. Industry is drugstore. His home was rented, and he was able to read and write. So that's kind of all the trappings that they asked in a census um, back then. In the 1920 city directory here in Goldsboro, which I have open on the table there, um, Dr. Frederick is still listed as the only black druggist in the classified section, classified business section of the directory. And he has moved his business from Chestnut Street to 301 South James Street, which is, um, I'm sorry, that's 1920. Yeah, 1920. Uh, 301 South James Street, which is, this is a Sanborn map, which we have up here. This is where his office is. I don't know, my shaky hand. <laughs> you can read drug, drugs, um, drugs only first floor, or drugs, first floor only there. 
it's that brick building at the corner of um, Spruce and South James. His home in 1920 was located at 217 West Elm Street. It was a one-story dwe dwelling near the corner, near the um, northeast corner of West Elm Street and South George Street. That's a lot of direction <laughs> right there. But basically, if you're headed out of town on Elm Street, going towards the highway, and you, you're sitting at George Street stoplight, it's that corner on your right, right there. That's where his house was. So he was uh, published by a man, or published and edited in a book, a man by the name of A.B. Caldwell in 1921. It's called History of American Negro, and it went state by state. So this one is specific for North Carolina. Dr. Frederick was born in Warsaw, Duplin County in 1886. His father was born a free person of color and became a carpenter. Dr. Frederick's father was the son of a slave. In Fayetteville on Christmas Day, 1912, Dr. Frederick married Miss Annie L. Jones of Raleigh. Mrs. Jones was educated at Shaw University. As a, <clears throat> as a boy, young Frederick attended the Warsaw Public Schools. From there, he passed to the what was called A&M University at Greensboro where he studied for two years. He took his courses in pharmacy at Shaw University and was awarded a degree in pharmacy in 1911. While in school in 1910, he began his work as a druggist in Charlotte, and in 1912 he moved to Goldsboro where he ran the, the Wayne Drug Company on South James Street. Uh, the 1900 federal census indicates that the Roberts family in Warsaw and Duplin County at the age of 13 consisted of his father, John W. Frederick, born in 1848, his mother born in 1854, and his four siblings on a farm that his father owned outright. His father, a carpenter, could read and write. His mother, a homemaker, could not. Frederick was drafted into the Army during World War I. You have his registration card here for World War I. Um, and his marriage and death certificates. So this is his marriage certificate here and his death certificate right there. After the war, he continued his pharmacy business and unfortunately passed away, divorced from Annie, and spent three and a half years at Terry Hospital. The cause of death being general paralysis of the insane, which was inevitably fatal, and it accounted for as much as 25% of the primary diagnosis for residents in public psychiatric hospitals. Um, and it's, it was online, it's, it's uh, basically he contracted syphilis. Um, he belonged to the Baptist Church and was a member of the Masons, the Odd Fellows, and the United Order of Pythians. He owns a home and other property in Goldsboro at the time and takes an active part in all movements among the people looking for the betterment of conditions. He was of the opinion that the best interests of the race are to be promoted by qualifying to vote in intelligently by work and economy and adjustment to conditions so as to live with all people without friction and by serving God at all times. Moving on to a more civic organization, 
the Knights of Gideon at 303 South James Street, the same building as Mr. Frederick there, the Knights of Gideon, uh, was a fraternal and mutual aid organization founded in Norfolk, Virginia in 1897 and chartered in Durham, North Carolina in 1898. They had chapters in cities around the state, including Durham, Goldsboro, Wilson, Warrington, Charlotte, and New Bern. In addition to providing sick and burial insurance to their members, the Knights also donated money to worthy causes, including the upkeep of schools for African-American children and the New Bern Relief Fund after the 1922 fire that claimed over a thousand homes. That fire in New Bern in 1922 displaced predominantly African Americans uh, to a different part of town, which became the Five Points area. By 1914, the Knights had over 300 lodges. In Goldsboro, Annie, there's a lot of Annies in these stories. Annie M. Whiteley was one of the early Supreme Scribes in Goldsboro. Her home was at 315 West Pine Street, just around the corner from the uh, lodge. She was married to William Whiteley with three kids in, 1910, in the 1910 census. Her occupation was listed as bookkeeper at, at an insurance office. She had one son, two daughters, son named John, daughter named Hattie, and Susie, and by 1940, Hattie was a teacher at School Street School and is still living in the Whiteley House on Pine Street. William was a laborer at a warehouse and they owned their own home outright. So as you can see in the city directories, they're listed, the, the businesses, you see the asterisk there, and then she was other people worked there, but uh, she's listed as the main contact. And if you look her up by her name, it's kind of the reverse there. Uh, Mr. James Guest, he was, uh, Guest, I'm sorry, he was an undertaker at 321 South James Street. Here's James and Mrs. Pine. And you can see Undertaker written in the 1918 uh, Sanborn map there. So James Gass was a funeral, funeral director and embalmer. He lived on Denmark Street, which is now part of Elmwood Estates. He married in 1905 to Annie Smith <laughs> of Raleigh. In World War I, he too was drafted and indicates that he was born May 2nd, 1888. And at that time, he resided at 316 Denmark Street. He was of medium build and medium height. This is all on his registration card. Brown eyes, black hair, occupation as an undertaker, and married to Annie Guess. This is their marriage records here. You can see James Guess, Annie Smith, also, in the census records, they get as, as detailed as asking you how many weeks um, per month you work, and his response was 52 weeks a year at 60 hours per week. And his funeral par um, his leading black funeral director of Goldsboro in the Goldsboro, Goldsboro Daily Argus in 1920. It's kind of amazing what you come across when you look into old newspapers. Apparently, James lost his keys in Goldsboro in 1920, and they put it in the newspaper. June 1920, he lost his keys. And I kept going through several months, and the thing was still in there, so I don't know if he found his keys or not. But he did um, lost his keys in June, but got a new hearse in July of that year. <laughs> so James Guest loses his keys in June uh, 1920, a new hearse in 1940, and this article was in the uh, 19, what was it, yeah, July 1920 paper, and it reads, 
commendable consideration, James Guest, the leading colored funeral director of Goldsboro, has today received a Crane and Breed Rio Special Auto Hearse. Manufactured by Crane and Breed Manufacturing Company of Cincinnati, Ohio, the recognized leading hearse builders of the United States, which added to his present equipment, his present equipment, uh, which makes his the best equipped colored undertaking establishment in the state. By prompt and courteous service to those in whose homes his services are needed, James has won an inviolable reputation in his profession among the colored people of this city and section. Kennan Guess, like the old Hotel Kennan, spelled the same, who is associated with him has recently passed a most complimentary examination before the State Board of Examiners for Embalmers in Charlotte. So 1920, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company has an office at 427 South James, James Street. <clears throat> and John Saps is the agent there. North Carolina Mutual, I'll go into detail in just a minute. But this building is at the, like at the corner of, uh, it's no longer there, of course. Uh, this is James and Elm Street. So there used to be a two-story building there with several shops downstairs and offices upstairs. The mutual office was upstairs there. Okay, so founded by John C. Merrick, a man born into slavery in Clinton, North Carolina in 1859, North Carolina Mutual, he learned to read and write <clears throat> at a Reconstructionist school, married and lived with his wife while attending barbering school in Raleigh, North Carolina. Upon completing school, he opened his own barber shop in Durham where he met Washington Duke. Mr. Duke took kind to Merrick and helped him open more barber shops and other businesses. In 1898, uh, Merrick, along with several investors, founded the North Carolina Mutual and Provident Society, which later became North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company. In 1920, Easton R. Williams was the manager of the office at 427 South James. His wife, Lavinia, uh, he and his wife, Lavinia, lived at 807 Isabel Street. Other businesses on James Street in 1920 included Dr. William H. Bryant at 427 in that same building at the uh, corner of Elm and, and James. Um, Mr. Benjamin Franklin Clay, he was listed as a piano tuner, the only piano tuner listed in the city directory in 1920. He lived on Elm Street right around the corner from James. Um, and I was able to find, he and his wife were buried at uh, Elmwood Cemetery, Some gravestones there. Um, John K. Darden lived at 219 West Pine Street. He was listed as the only art store or artist in 1920 city directories. And he also had a shoe shining business. His wife was a housekeeper, Mildred, and they lived at 308 Pine Street. Mr. Clay, he, they, he was advertised in some of the news Argus papers. He charged $5 to, to tune a piano in 1919, and today that's about $80. He finished three years of college, and his wife completed two years in nursing school. Um, and Reverend Clarence Dillard married the couple. Other businesses included Mr. Edward Spicer, who was a barber and a 
on in that same building, 427 James Street. James Lloyd had an eating house, lived at 304 South James. Wayne, the Wayne Cafe at 305 South James, operated by James Barnett. A grocery at 429 South James. And the, Odd, the Odd Fellows Hall for African Americans was around the corner on 404 South George Street. And finally, upstairs above the Mr. Um, Dr. Frederick's pharmacy was the United Order of True Reformers on Pine Street. So it's a Pine Street entrance upstairs. It's the United Order of True Reformers was an African-American fraternal organization founded in Richmond in 1881 by William Washington Brown, a, more, a former enslaved person and Union Army veteran teacher and Methodist minister. So we're going to move on to the 1940s on James Street. These are just glimpses of, from the Sanborn maps of James. This is the corner of Pine and James. This is what many locals remember as uh, Jackson's Drug Store and Pharmacy. Uh, Further up, James at 319 was actually the James Theater, uh, movie theater. So first we'll start with the James Theater at 321 South James Street. The building is no longer there. In 1940, the theater was run by Robert L. Baum. He and his wife, Jeanette, lived at Hotel Goldsboro. The building had two shop front stores it opened in 1928 as the Rex Auditorium. And prior to opening on James Street, the Rex Theater was located at 107 West Chestnut Street. The theater was renamed in 1940, and by 1955, it had 370 seats. I pulled some newspaper articles from 1940 and looked to see if I could find some some of the actual movies that were advertised as playing, and I found quite a few. Um, this picture is from a Little Washington reunion poster of a young man sitting on a on a um, a sign in front of the James Theater there, and the sign underneath says, "The sky's the limit." And this man there is the owner. You can see some posters on the wall. So in 1940. A man by the name of Paul Robeson um, played, acted in the movie seen here in this poster, Emperor Jones. Emperor Jones is a 1933 American adaptation of Eugene O'Neill's 1920 play of the same title. It was written for the screen by playwright DuBose Hayward and, star, and starred uh, Paul Robeson. So this movie was filmed before uh, Gone with the Wind, starring a black actor. Mr. Robeson played on stage both in the United States and the UK. The film was made outside of the Hollywood studio system, financed with private money from new wealthy producers it was filmed at Kaufman Astoria Studios in New York. Paul Leroy Robeson, born 1898, died 1976. American-based baritone concert artist, stage and film actor, athlete and activist who became famous for his cultural accomplishments and for political stances. <laughs> uh, he was educated at Rutgers, New York University, Columbia University, and the University of London. I've just never found um, a man that early starring in a film with all those accolades. Some other movies included westerns like Phantom Rancher and classics like Road to Singapore with Bing Crosby, Dorothy L'Amour, and Bob Hope. Terry and the Pirates was a serial film and the tenth in its series and based on a comic strip.
Clarence Mews, The Broken Earth. The Broken Earth is an American film written and directed by Roman Frulich in 1939. The 11-minute short film played after the film on the left, uh, Honeymoon in Bali. It's directed by Frulich in 1939. It stars Clarence Muse, the man on the, on the right there, as a sharecropper and widower who plows his farm and tries to take care for his sick son. Pleading and praying for divine in intervention, the film includes a soundtrack of Negro spirituals. Muse owned a ranch that was used as a filmmaking location. Um, he was the first African American to appear in a starring role in a film, 1929's Hearts in Dixie. He acted for 50, year, 50 years and appeared in more than 150 films. He was inducted into the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame in 1973. This is the building that the uh, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company moved to by the 1940s. At 301, 303 South James Street, this is as it looks today. Um, I talked with a local man who is 85 years old, Mr. Pinckney Cherry, who worked in this building starting in the late 70s, and, and he enlightened me on just how successful that particular branch of the uh, life insurance company was. He told me the Goldsboro office he managed was the number one producer in the entire company at one point in his, in his career. In 1940, a man by the name of Easton Williams was the agent there. The Knights of Gideon also met there, and the small one-story building on this side here has been many things. Uh, but at this time, at 1940, it was called the Ideal Cafe, owned and run by Mr. John Smith and his wife, Ruth, they live just up the street at 211 James Street. So going back to the Guest family in 1940, James Guest has, had moved his business across the street at, still as an undertaker at, to 314 South James Street, which is, was right beside the um, Elks Lodge here, which the Elks Lodge is still there. And um, James Guest Jr. and his cousin, Kenan Guest, which, who was referred to in the newspaper article, uh, were drafted into World War II. These are their draft cards. Kenan served in Washington, D.C. On his draft card, it says employee's name and address and, or I'm sorry, place of employment or business. And it says a exclusive office of president. I'm not really sure what that means. I couldn't really figure that out. But I did find the building he worked in as a messenger, an errand boy. It's still standing in Washington, D.C., and it's now a luxury furniture store. <laughs> so other businesses in 1940 on James Street. Uh, the James Street Cafe at 324, just kind of hopping up the street. There's a fish market at 326. The Green Parrot Cafe, which I've heard a lot about, um, at 327. Uh, billiards, 329, getting up to Jackson Drug Company at 400, 401 across the street, Mr. George Parker's Grocery Store, and the Tuxedo Club was at 420 South James Street. Uh, some more businesses, Mini King's Restaurant, still going up James or down James, 418. Miss Fennel had some furnished rooms to rent. Hamilton's Funeral Home at 426. Goldsboro Men's Club in that building at 427. Another mutual life insurance company in that same building. And also a dentist and a lawyer. 
Uh, and at 429, Mr. the physician, Mr. Weathers, Dr. Weathers. So now we're getting into the 60s. <laughs> uh, this picture, Mr. Simmons drew, our resident artist um, of the building at 305, 301, 303, 305, South James Street. And that's where Mr. Pinckney started his, his stint at North Carolina Mutual in the 70s. I did not pull much, there really wasn't much visually to pull for, I couldn't, for these businesses um, in the past. And that's kind of the point of this is to ask people to bring pictures, um, voices, stories, and share with us, the museum, and try to document this stretch of uh, South James Street. But most of the businesses you'll probably recognize, uh, Mr. Witted was an attorney at 209 James Street. North Carolina Mutual was still there. The Alice H. Brown Public Library in 1960. Where did I, her picture is over there on the table. She was H.B. Brown's uh, wife, widow, uh, uh, wife, and um, they named the African American Public Library after her. And Miss Lavinia Watson. Uh, was the librarian, and that was to, that was in this, the um, North Carolina Mutual Building. There were apartments at that time in 1960 above in that building. Uh, a maid, lady who worked as a maid at the St. Mary's Rectory on William Street, and a dishwasher at Central Lunch uh, lived up there. Guest barbershop, Mr. Guest Guess's brother had a barber shop at 305, that smaller addition there in 1960. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, funeral, uh, Rhodes Mutual Burial Association was at 310 South James Street, right next to the, um, near the Elks Lodge. There were several taxi companies on James Street in, in uh, 1960. There was Safety Taxi Company and Star Taxi, and they even list the uh, taxi drivers through the Star. Another fish market, Billiards, Mr. Willie Simmons. I've heard his name a lot with people I've talked to in his uh, little store there on Pine Street. Um, Green Parrot, uh, Green Parrot Cafe, sorry, uh, 335 James. Jackson Drug Company, filled prescriptions, drugs, sundry items, fountain services, and delivery service. A lot of the folks I talked to remember going to Jackson Drug Company, getting kind of ice cream or a shake, or, and then walking across the street, uh, hitting the movie theater. A new sandwich shop at 402 and the 400 block, Star Dry Cleaner. Uh, Mr. Jones owned that. There is another taxi company in the 400 block, and of course, Hamilton Funeral Chapel and Hamilton Funeral Home. Another mutual life insurance company, and Mr. John Jones and his wife Dorothy ran a dry cleaners in, at the corner of Elm and South James Street. Speaking of Hamilton Funeral Home, this is, uh, I, had, I got a phone call from a lady in Greensboro, Ms. Dolores Bland Knight, and her mother, this is her mother on the left, and her funeral, there's, this is her, her obituary in the paper uh, her funeral was held at Hamilton Funeral Home, but she was quite the lady. She was born in 1907, passed in 1989. She was from Dudley. She went to Shaw University, 
and then got her master's from the University of Connecticut, as did her husband here, which was Mrs. Knight's grandmother, I mean grandfather. So this is her grandmother, grandfather. Um, Mr. Charles Bland, he was, became the principal at School Street School. And those are the two uh, in their graduate gowns. She worked, Ms. Bland worked for the county school system for 10 years and the Goldsboro City School System for 36 years. She was a charter member of the Professional Women's Club, which is the local chapter of the National Federation of Women. She was on the advisory council for wages and she attended First African Baptist Church for 69 years. The, these articles here, and this, this is just 1955, the graduating class of Dillard uh, High School with Mr. H.V. Brown as principal, Mr. Edward House as vice principal, Minnie Jackson down here, Alba, Alma Minnis, and Ms. Charity Hatcher, and Arlena Rigsby here. It's a large graduating class. I put this up here. I was digging through some files, and uh, I don't know if you all knew um, Miss Ann Hurry, who passed away in the sp spring of last year, I believe. Uh, we had a bunch of these scanned and had a file for her, so that I pulled those for her. She. Mom actually worked with Ann. Um, I remember getting off the bus and <laughs> going to Edgewood and uh, used to see Miss Hurry, but she's got a lot of pictures that aren't labeled or identified in our files. Um, so again, that's part of why we are doing this program this evening is to get people to bring their photos. You can keep them, we would just like to hear stories, perhaps scan them if you let us, um, and just get a conversation started about James Street. And that's why I picked just these two blocks of James Street to start with. So with that, I'll just open up for any questions or comments or stories, if anybody. Deans, D-E-A-N. So the question was, did I find any factual information on Dean's market on Olivia Lane? I did not. I did not um, get to Olivia Lane. It's in a different neighborhood. It's in the Goldsboro Heights neighborhood, which is kind of over near the current Dillard, Dillard, uh, what is it, a charter school? Um, so no, I did not, but I'm sure we could flip through the city directories and find it. <laughs> 